everyone, and welcome back to the second day of Automation Days Asia 2023. I'm super excited to see all of you back again at this second day of the program. We already had a very first great, uh, first great day yesterday in which we learned from experts, saw a lot of coding sessions, did a number of panel discussions. So I'm very excited to continue our program today. In the first five um, um, uh, minutes of this program, I'm going to give you a brief introduction around the platform and what you can expect. And then I will hand over to our keynote speaker. But for those of you who are joining for the first time today, it's good to know what you can expect and how the, everything will work. And during this uh, conference, we will have a two track session after the initial keynote. I will be hosting the first track and my colleague, John Wee Lee, who's the head of services, will be hosting the second track. For this program, we have managed to secure 26 different speakers from 14 different nations, ranging from the US all the way to Australia. We've put extreme great care in putting together a program of thought leaders and industry experts who will hopefully inspire you to think differently around automation and automation best practices. The program for today is composed as follows. We'll start with the keynote from Chris right after my quick introduction. Then we will break out into two different tracks. And during the lunch break, we will have a centralized panel discussion again. After that, we will once again break out into two, the two different tracks mm -hmm. and we will end today's session with the closing ceremony and the handout of the Automation Days Awards to the um, submitted proposals for automation excellence. Before we get started, I would like to sincerely thank our partners for making this event possible. As you all know, registration for this event is completely free. And that means that we could not be able to host this program without the generous support of our partners. I would like to spe specifically call out the Service Automation Framework Alliance as a co-organizer and APMG International as a supporting partner. And a special uh, thanks to some of the leading um, uh, technology partners in the automation domain, UiPath, Blue Prism, and Automation Anywhere for generously supporting our program today. Good. For those of you who want to join while they're on the go, note that this year we also, for the first time, introduced the mobile app the link has been put into the chat, so if you would like to join uh, um, remote, please feel free to download the app and join all the conference sessions live with us today. For those of you who are joining today on the first time, note that the whole value of doing a virtual conference live is that you have the ability to interact with our speakers. I strongly encourage you to make use of that. And if you have any questions for our speakers on the right-hand side of the panel, you will find a, a question button, and there you can ask questions for our speakers during all the sessions. Please use the question box instead of the chat, because in the chat there's typically a lot of comments, and the question box has the functionality that people can upvote questions that they might find interesting and important. Other than that, note that just like yesterday, there is the ability to send reactions, emotions for slides you find interesting, surprising, or um, something that you find funny. So please use the emotions to um, um, interact with the speakers during the presentations. It's always a lot of fun. Good. Last but not least, note that everything will be recorded um, and that the recordings will be put up in the next week on the Cybin website as well as on the YouTube channel. And of course, there are the hashtags, so you can follow us on the various social media platforms. Please use the ADA 2023 or Automation Days Asia hashtags because that will help us track uh, who is communicating about the different topics. Good. Now that we have had this introduction, um, I would like to go quickly towards our opening keynote uh, and introduce Christopher Surdock, who is the Managing Director at Quantix and the author of The Care and Feeding of Bots. And he is going to provide us with a very interesting keynote around automation and governance in the age of generative AI. 
Chris, it's a great pleasure to welcome you towards Automation Days Asia. I'm super excited to have you with us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning to some of you. It's evening for me here in Los Angeles, uh, and interesting that we live in uh, live in an era when we all have to turn into TV producers in order to get our work done. Uh, it's one of those interesting side effects of uh, the pandemic and everything we learn from it. Um, if you're like me and you've got some interest in uh, automation, artificial intelligence, we have had a very interesting few days, have we not? Certainly Friday, uh, I guess it would be uh, Saturday for, for you uh, in Asia, uh, a great deal happened in the industry. <laughs> and we're all trying to figure out what uh, what the implications of that are. One, one of the things that um, appears to be true is that part of the challenges that OpenAI had to do with governance and um, that's something that we'll be discussing very much in this particular uh, deck. It's something that I've worked uh, in and around for the better, for most of my career, 30 plus years. And I think it's, um, it's even more relevant now uh, with particularly artificial intelligence um, in the degree to which a lot of what happens in an AI is, is that black box effect. It's inside of the, the neural network, it's inside of the mathematics and you can't really see what's going on there. Um, so a little bit about me, my background, I actually started my career building spacecraft with uh, Lockheed Martin and NASA. Um, and I was, I was one of the people on the resilience and mission success side. So rather than trying to design the spacecraft so we would actually get to Mars, I was on the team that said, how do we make sure it doesn't blow up along the way? And then later in my career, as I shifted over to um, IT, records management, data and analytics, that kind of stuck with me. So I'm, I'm always kind of looking at what's the potential downside of a new technology uh, or new platform. And great, let's get it out there and make it work, but let's also protect it and make sure that, you know, we don't fail in, in very significant ways. Um, that's really been a consistent topic across my three books, uh, certainly care and feeding of bots. I, I know that there's a lot of interest in automation in this audience. So I've been in and around that space uh, specific to RPA and, and machine learning and AI for the better part of, I would say, 12 years. But realistically, I've been doing process and business automation for a quarter of a century. Hard to believe. Um, and, and my next couple of books coming out, Information Governance for AI. Uh, so literally a very specific book on this particular topic. And then also an interesting uh, one that I'm planning on um, how this technology is, has changed our world uh, from a social perspective. So. Uh, I'm also a big history buff, so I, I, I love uh, this quote from in the uh, U.S. Army General uh, Omar Bradley, who was a commander of, of U.S. military forces in Europe in World War II. He had the saying of uh, amateur study strategy, professional study logistics, realizing that to win a war, yeah, you have to have tactics and you have to have strategy, but it's all about getting men and materials, you know, what, what do they say, uh, bullets and uh, I forget. Anyway, uh, all the material to the fight so that you can actually overwhelm it. And the parallel I draw in this world of AI, uh, or all process automation and analytics, but AI in particular, is um, amateur study technology, professional study data. Uh, and that's particularly, it, it was very true in the day of, of RPA. Um, there was a lot of concern in, in the RPA day about platforms and which platform we're going to use and how do we deploy it and picking the right tool was critically important. But at the end of the day, if you the, your automation was no better than you could define your process, and the process was defined by data, this is dramatically more true in AI, and particularly generative AI, as as we're using with things like ChatGPT. Um, source data is even is dramatically more critical, um, and and it's something where good governance of that data, good uh, data curation, is going to be a driving factor in whether or not you're in that five percent of companies, according to Gartner or Forrester, that succeed with each new technology wave. Um, understanding your data, uh, using it correctly, and applying it correctly is going to be absolutely fundamental to having any success with this technology. So, why is that? Because all tools, AI tools in particular, require training. What am I training it on? Data. Um, and, and the more data you feed it as represent, so this is a diagram of a neural network if, for those not familiar with it. Um, what, what I also find interesting is the mathematics of, of all this machine learning stuff for the most part is uh, close to 100 years old. Neural networks as, as a technology is a good 40 years old. I took my first classes on neural network in 1996. Sad to say, but so the technology hasn't really changed that much. It's, it's our processing capacity 
and the volume of data that we have available to do that processing. Certainly, um, the architecture behind ChatGPT and these generative systems is is kind of new and different. But again, it's based upon historic uh, historic mathematics that we've known for quite some time. Um, so we're, we're pumping all this data through a neural network. It's learning by example is, is what we show it. Um, if this, then that. And the more uh, certain outputs are correlated to those inputs, the, the stronger the learning is going to be. Um, and basically all this is is statistics. People say, you know, well, what's your definition of AI? And I always say it's just applied statistics. And realistically, that's all it is. Um, I'm not going to get deep into math. Most people hate math. I certainly did but I've had a career where I've had to know math. And, and one of the key things that is critical in understanding AI, and frankly, was really important in being successful with RPA 10 years ago or, or five years ago, is the idea of a normal distribution. For any population that you're measuring data on, for if any particular characteristic, it is almost always going to follow a normal distribution. Most stuff is going to be kind of average, and then you have extremes at either end. Um, why this isn't particularly useful is that the more normal something is, the more the more kind of trends towards the middle, the more predictable it is, right? And and so this is one of the things we learned in RPA. You could succeed with RPA because it was rules based, and so the majority of transactions, the normal transaction, was readily addressed with rules. So why would I need statistics and why would I need artificial intelligence? It's for the outliers, right? The outliers are kind of what threw off my earlier attempts at automation, something I didn't expect, an exception to a rule, et cetera. Um, and, and with AI, if we're teaching an AI normalized data or data that follows this normal distribution, we're still going to have the vast majority of information is kind of in that middle ground that sort of follows expectations and rules. But we're also going to have to deal with the outliers. That's the value proposition of AI over something like RPA. Um, is is I have a better chance of being able to deal with the outliers, even though they're st statistically insignificant. The problem with st something being statistically insignificant is when I have a trillion transactions, it's going to happen. Or even a billion transactions, the unlikely event becomes inevitable. Um, and that's what these systems are starting to address, actually. So this, this leads to this notion of I need to invert the training regimen of an AI and I actually have to engineer and manufacture data that does this. I don't want to train an AI based upon normalized data. I want to train it on anti-normal data. Why is that? Because if, if I look at most of, most of the things that the AI is, is going to encounter is going to be in that normal range, the middle range. I, so it already understands, it's already been trained on how to deal with those situations. What it doesn't understand and what it hasn't been taught is what to do in the exceptions, the high end and the, and the low end, the high tail and low tail of the distribution. Since that is the instances where the AI is not really going to know what to do, I want to overtrain on those cases so that when it occurs, it actually has a chance of responding correctly. Right? If, if I only give one or two examples of, of that exceptional case, when the exception comes up, it's not well trained in how to handle it. So I actually want to invert my training and overtrain on the exceptions and sort of undertrain on the normal. Otherwise, I'm not likely to get a lot of value out of uh, an AI um, sort of sort of scenario. Uh, this leads me to uh, if, if you're a developer, code or whatever, there's Ashby's law of requisite variety. And, and to simplify it, it basically says the answer to any problem has to be at least as complex as as the problem itself. We kind of learned this in algebra in, in high school, right? You know, if, if I had three variables in equation, I need three equations to solve all three variables. Same thing happens here. And what's, what's really interesting is if you think about it, um, we are trying to attack human systems, natural systems, analog systems with these digital uh, tools, which by necessity are always just approximations of reality. If you really think about calculus and how it works, even though we're, we're convinced that it's perfectly accurate, it's always an approximation. Whenever I'm using calculus, it's an approximation of reality. And what that means is that there's always that slight rounding error in our approximations that, again, over billions or trillions of calculations, billions or trillions of, of uh, responses, you're going to get it wrong eventually. You're going to get an accumulation of that error, and it's going to cause problems. Our systems are irreducibly complex, whether we like it or not. 
And, and we have to remember that we're always applying this sort of approximation approach, the digital approximations of the analog universe. And so we always have to be prepared for that error to be out there. Um, and, and, and again, so every digital system we build is by definition an approximation because the mathematics we use are also approximations. Uh, and this unfortunately gives us the illusion of control. Um, you know, back when I was working with NASA, we thought we knew what we were doing with the shuttle. We thought we, we, we knew what we were doing with Mars Observer. Um, there was the, the mission to Mars where famously the rocket uh, was built using metric and the software that ran the rocket was, was uh, built using English units. These kinds of things happen. So you need to be prepared for that. And the more we believe that we're on, on top of this and we're in control of these complex systems, the more likely something catastrophic happens when we find out we're wrong. A great example of that, um, if you're if you're familiar, Three Mile Island, the nuclear power plant that in the late 70s in the United States melt, melted down. I actually got to visit that uh, when I was a high schooler, which sounds strange, but this is a picture of the actual control room at Three Mile Island. And what they don't show you is, I mean, that front panel is you know, probably, I don't know, 20 meters wide, <clears throat> but that room is also about 20 meters deep. There's multiple rows of additional computer panels and, and dials and gauges and so forth going way back behind these people. And what's interesting is that the one light, the one signal that would have told the controllers what was actually going wrong at Three Mile Island during the, the emergency was like five rows back, way behind them. And it wouldn't probably occur to anyone to take a look at that. Um, when the accident happened, every single light on the panel that you see there was flashing and, and buzzing and, and sirens going off and so forth. So to take the time to think to go back, you know, five rows back and find that one signal that would have actually corrected the problem was extraordinarily unlikely. Um, so any data set, you know, getting back to the words here, every data set has some false positives and false negatives. And, and that's a significant challenge because if you don't train for, if you don't invent false negatives and false positives to train into the AI, it's not going to know when they occur. Many, many years ago, I also worked for, uh, worked with the American Red Cross on the system that managed the blood supply in the United States. And this was in the mid nineties when HIV was a significant problem. And back then the tests for HIV for people that were donating blood was like 99.9 .9 something percent accurate. So it was quite accurate, but there was still that slight error. And back then, uh, this was after my space days, but you know, we talked about how a false positive is, you know, so let's say you had a false positive on a blood test. What that basically means is that you tested positive for HIV, but you didn't have HIV. So it, at first that sounds like it's a really bad day, but later when you find out you didn't have it, it, it actually might not be that bad of a day. So false positives are kind of annoying, um, but, but not like life-threatening. Now, if I think of a false negative with that, false negative would say you actually had HIV and you're HIV positive, but you tested as not having it, and then your blood was put into someone else, right? So, so back in my space days and back in those days, it was false positives cost money, false negatives cost lives. Same is true with Three Mile Island, Meltdown, Fukushima in Japan. So we need to anticipate false positives and false negatives. We need to design them into our training data set so that we have some sense of of their existence so that we can, the AI has some notion of how to respond when they occur. Um, and that has to be engineered into the data. You, you, you wouldn't know uh, it was there unless you put it in there artificially. Great example of this is um, there, there's uh, Apple machines. So uh, when you harvest apples, they go past these optical sensors where they're looking for um, apples that are the, the right ripeness. They're not overripe, they're not underripe, they're, they're uh, very good. And how do you do that? You you cycle thousands and thousands and thousands of good apples through the optical software, and then it learns what, what a good apple looks like. Um, but then that leads to the problem. If you see these these apples, they look you know delicious and luscious and red and so forth. Um, what happens if you show that same software this? Hopefully you all know what that is. It's a red cherry. Certainly looks a lot like an apple, kind of has the same shape, certainly has the same color. Um, definitely a size difference, but this could easily come off as a false positive, right? It sure looks like a, a red apple, um, so maybe we let it get through. Conversely, this would not register most likely as an apple unless you trained it that, hey, apples come in more than one color red. 
Um, so this would potentially get rejected by that software. Hence, this is an example of a false negative, right? It is an apple, but we don't treat it like one. And, and this is a common problem that's existed uh, for as long as we've been doing this sort of work. Um, the, uh, the, which leads to this whole discussion of biases. Um, and, and bias is one of those problems where it's always inherent. And, and I coined a term, I think it was last year, bias vision, where in, in particularly in the mathematics that we use with artificial intelligence, bias doesn't just kind of exist, it multiplies. It, it multiplies geometrically, like nuclear fission, right? If you start a chain reaction in, in, a, in a nuclear material, it explodes out of control. And that's frequently what we find with biased uh, data within AI systems. Um, so again, these systems and the mathematics almost always enhance impacts of biases, which is why you must engineer bias in to your data sets so you can then test it and, and train it out. Um, and they typically reinforce your beliefs rather than undermine them. All kinds of examples of bias. I'm not going to go into a detailed thing of that, but um, certainly look into it. And this also renders um, not so long ago, I think it was in, uh, about eight or nine years ago, uh, some people at Google were trying to train a uh, machine learning algorithm on if it could tell the difference between dogs and wolves. And so they went through thousands and thousands of images and trained it. And they thought that they got you know pretty good results, high 90 something percentile of accuracy with this algorithm for determining, is this a dog? Is this a wolf? Um, and interestingly, when they started looking at uh, the results of the system, they were getting some quirky results. And as they looked into it a little bit more, what they actually discovered is the AI was keying off of snow in that most of, a significant proportion of the pictures of wolves actually had snow in the background. So in almost any picture where there was a white background, it thought it was a wolf. And that was largely the case in many instances. But the real training that took place, the, the thing that was in the black box, the black box of the neural network learned is snow equals wolf, not, you know, puffy, puffy, whatever equals dog. Um, so, you, you, again, you really need to test for these sort of biases to get them out. And one of the examples um, people talk about uh, uh, artificial intelligence and driving cars like uh, Tesla. And there was the, the first fatality with a Tesla self-driving car was in Arizona here in the United States several years ago. But um, what was interesting is that it was at night. The, the, there was a woman crossing the road and she got hit by the, by the self-driving car. But she was crossing the road at night. And, and it wasn't a crosswalk, right? So just walking across a, a, an open patch of road. What's the thing that was missing when the, when, or what's in a crosswalk normally? White lines. What well, wasn't where she was walking? There were no white lines. So is that the same sort of uh, failure or bias problem um, that we have with the wolves with the snow background? Don't know. But I mean, again, these sorts of things um, are common and they replicate. And it's a common set of problems. So what, what is ChatGPT? I'm not going to drain this, but basically it is um, we're training a, a large scale um, neural network with billions and billions and billions of examples of human language. Um, and then hoping that it from that the volume of human language that it worked through that statistically, if, if you if you give it one particular word, statistically, it knows what's the likely next word. And it just keeps doing that. Um, Alon thinks we're, you know, really close to general AI. I'm not exactly sure. Um, and we can get into that a little bit later. But again, it's just a large language model. It's just a neural network, very large with many, many nodes and many hidden layers. So there's a lot of depth to it. And you just put a huge amount of, of data through it in order to train it. Um, again, it's not magic, it's math. And all you're really doing is you're saying, if you if you use this one particular word in your question, what is most likely to be the next word based upon looking at billions and billions of examples of language? Um, and it's the probability of what the next word is. There's, there's a sense that there's that the AI like ChatGPT understands what you're asking. It hasn't a clue of what you're asking. None whatsoever. It just knows. So here's an example. You ask the question, what cars come in black? It knows that. All right. If you start with the word what, cars might show up as the next word some percentage of time. And then black, uh, after cars with some percentage. And then different models with some percentage. It's literally just making statistical best guesses based upon what it's been shown. 
right? Um, how would it describe itself? I think, you know, it's, it's funny how it says this. Um, not, not invented to solve a particular problem, but rather to improve machines ability to generate human like text. It's not human text. It's human like based upon those probabilities. <coughs> One of the great challenges of this, um, what's unlike our use of AI and ML in the past with things like, uh, Netflix suggestions and so forth. That's a very specific use case. ChatGPT is is open, right? You can ask it anything, and it was released into the wild, so to speak. So we have this very feral technology with over 200 million people interacting with it, asking different questions and so forth. And, and the other thing that's very significant is that as you interact with it, the there's feedback on the results, right? So um, it's trying to learn from the ongoing interactions, not just the upfront training of, of billions of conversations, but also to further reinforce what it knows based upon the additional billions of interactions that are taking place. Um, the, the problem with this is that it, it really can't respond any better than from the, the core data it was trained on. So if, if the training data was older than a certain date and you ask a question from after that date, it can't respond effectively. Um, it has no idea of what it actually is saying. And people say it, it's creepily like talking to a person, but that's just based upon the statistics. Um, these technologies are what I call context blind. They have no idea what you're actually asking. They only know what the likely next word is. And so when people talk about prompt engineering is, is how you get better results, that what you're doing in prompt engineering is you structure your questions and you ask them in a certain way so that you're providing context to the model so it responds back in a context richer format. Right, so it, it has no clue of what you're asking nor of how it's responding. The way in which you ask the questions can give you different results, which by itself should be worrying from a governance perspective, but the way in which you ask the questions can also give you better results. Um, the other challenge with this, and I think this is partially what came up last week or is, is coming to a head last week, is that someone has to be able to evaluate the results that you get from this technology. Someone who sees the responses need to know what's a right answer and what's a wrong answer. So if you ask, you know, you know what, what the example I give is American centric. I apologize. But if you ask, you know, what color is George Washington's white horse? If ChatGPT responds, it's brown, you need to know that that's a wrong answer. And if you don't know it's a wrong answer and you accept brown is the right answer for what color is George Washington's right horse, you just taught, taught chat GPT that the wrong answer is the right one and you're unlearning or you're teaching it to actually be deceptive as it turns out. This leads to huge governance problems and this, this issue of, of hallucinations. Um, there's tons of this that comes up and that's based upon this context, contextlessness of the technology, right? Depending upon how you pose the question, this thing will start responding and have no idea that it's telling you something wrong, something inappropriate, whatever. Um, and those of us that, you know, I've, I've been doing this work, natural language processing stuff for the better part of 20 years, we can very quickly hack into this system and, and find some really, really disturbing and, and unsettling results as a result. Um, ChatGPT has no idea what a correct answer is. It's just throwing up responses as you, as you get it. Um, if you accept uh, a response that LM gives you, you're telling it that the, the response that you gave is more acceptable for others as well, and that's part of its learning process. But if you accept something that's false, over time, more and more false responses are turned into, are, are accepted as, as correct responses. And so basically what we're doing is we're, we're teaching with ChatGPT how to be optimally deceptive um, and, and there's 200, 200 million of us that are teaching it to do this. How, you know, so if you reject a response that it gives saying, no, I don't think that's correct. It, it often kind of gaslights you and says, oh, I apologize. I misunderstood you or you misunderstood me. Let me take another crack at it. And for most people who have seen by the time you go about four layers deep, chat GPT just gives up. Right. And that's because you've gone down a statistical rabbit hole that it can no longer respond to as you push back. Right. And so there's research from earlier this year, not long after this stuff came out, that showed this thing is getting um, both dumber <laughs> to a certain extent and it's getting more deceptive. It's it's lying more so much so that I think I have it in here back in July of this year. OpenAI actually shut down the feedback me mechanism. 
Um, because it, it, they, people were seeing, there's a lot of research that was showing this stupefaction and uh, deceptiveness were, were growing at an alarming rate. Um, and, and unfortunately, this was fundamental to the design of, of how this works, right? The feedback mechanism. And the other thing to keep in mind is the vast majority of the training material, billions of, of pages of website stuff, a, a huge proportion of that was actually social media. So if you're training, if you're training an artificial intelligence to behave like a human, and the vast majority of the training material is social media, um, has anybody ever seen a post ever on social media that wasn't narcissistic, wasn't deceptive, wasn't lying? I mean, we're literally taking the worst source data for human communication that humans have ever created, and we're using that to train a super intelligence. Probably not a phenomenal idea. Um, so again, the more you press for an answer and you tell it that it's incorrect, the more it, it goes down this probability rabbit hole and, and it, it runs out of responses and will generally just give up. Um, and it, it'll just throw, it, it, it gets to the point where it can't guess anymore because it runs out of statistical possibilities. Um, we've seen all this before. For those of you that have been in automation and RPA in particular, we have this huge uh, boom of, of interest and then the trough of, of disillusionment and then some more, more reality. The challenge is this, and, and I've written about this extensively, the technology change keeps accelerating. So what you, you know, you, we used to have three or four years to evaluate a technology like RPA. Now you got three or four months. And it's not going to be long uh, in the future where it's three or four weeks, right? It, there's a lot of people that have, have committed to chat GPT and they're starting down that path and spending millions to implement it. And after last Friday, they might be, you know, taking a little bit of a pause. So um, this is going to be a challenge. Again, back in July, uh, OpenAI very quietly kind of shut down the, the classifier and the feedback mechanism because of that stupefaction and, and, and the deception and, and the hallucinations realizing that the system was going to continue to get worse and worse and worse over time unless they did that. So the challenge from a governance perspective, and I love this quote from IBM in, back in 1979, you can't, you don't want to help because a computer can never be held accountable. You don't want it to make decisions. This is late in my career. I went to law school and got a law degree because of, we were dealing with a lot of these issues, um, particularly in automation. We, got, we Many of us, if you've done automation, you've had the issue of, I want to read PDFs so I can do contract works. And the attorneys are like, absolutely not, unless it's 100% accurate, even though my humans doing it right now are only about 75% accurate or 80% accurate. Why the refusal? Because if I'm doing it with automation and it's not perfect every time, I don't know who to fire, right? I don't know who to sue. That And, and this is going to be an even greater challenge in an AI-enabled world where you're going to automate and, and run all these processes where it's, it's probabilistic, not rules-based, and you're not going to know when there's a false positive, false negative, or a bias in there. Um, so you're not going to know when you did something wrong until you're, it's pointed out that you did something wrong. Um, I, I love this image. Um, if you look closely, you know, the, the, architect, the College of Architecture and Planning apparently didn't do very much architecture or planning. Um, it, it, ChatGPT in particular is this really beautiful interface. It seems so wonderful to work with, but bad architecture is bad architecture. And a lot of how these um, generative AI systems were built is bad architecture with this feedback mechanism, with providing purely normalized data and not anti-normalized data, not training on biases, not training on false positives, false negatives. It was, it, it was doomed to kind of have these problems simply because of how it was built and how it was implemented. Fastest adopted technology ever until the next one comes along. Um, again, that's somewhat a challenge if, when we find out that we have some issues with it. Um, but we're going to continue on this path and it's going to continue to accelerate. I'm, I'm certain of it. Um, so what is missing is usually the most important. The governance discussion around this then becomes what is, is the data that you're using to train this thing, what it purports to be. Can you find biases in it? Can you find false positives, false negatives? And how, do, how can you be sure that the data that you're using is what it purports to be? If it's not, then you're going to inherently introduce and, and authenticate and enhance the bias that's, that's coming in through that data. And it's almost inevitable that that will happen it, it, unless you untrain it around that. Um, and then who's, who's qualified to make the determination if a certain set of data is appropriate, is effective, right? Particularly if you're talking about billions of, of chunks of information. Um, it's going to be a tremendous challenge, but if we don't do this correctly, then you, you will have 
uh, catastrophic failures to a certain extent that are unanticipated and un unanticipatable. That is to me the greater challenge as an engineer is that I'm not going to know what the potential failure mode is until it arrives. And its arrival is inevitable in these sorts of systems. Um, I'm going to stop for a second because the way this is set up, I can't see if there's questions. Um, and I want to see if there are any questions. So it looks like there are. Let's hit them. What advice would you offer to startups and small businesses considering the integration of large language model platforms? Um, what are you going to do when it fails? What, what, what's your plan for if you've integrated chat GPT or any of the others of these into your operations when it doesn't work for two hours, two days, two weeks, right? What's the contingency? When I'm talking to Fortune 500 companies and their executives, like we're going to wipe out a third of our workforce. Great, because automation can replace them. What happens when the automation doesn't work? Is your stock price going to fall by 10 percent, 80 percent? Uh, you know, can you recover at all? So, so that resilience, um, the ability to bounce back from from uh, losing the, the capacity, and keep in mind, you know, I, I love the saying, "Everyone's moved to the cloud," um, and and you talk to like attorneys or CIOs, and they're like, oh, "My data is in the cloud." No, it's not in the cloud. It's just in someone else's computer. <laughs> um, yeah, there's there's no cloud. There's just computers, and the question is, are you in control of them or is someone else? That's very much the case with these technologies. It's in someone else's control. They got your data, and and um, yeah, you're you're basically at their mercy uh, in terms of how their system operates and the results it generates. Uh, another question: In your experience, what misconceptions do organizations often have about the capabilities and limitations? Ho hopefully, everything I've discussed so far really addresses that. Right? There's this sense of it's this magical tool, and and um, it, it doesn't produce errors. You can always trust the results. None of that is true. Um, that you know the the the, the uh, emphasis of biases, the explosive growth of biases within the systems, the need to properly um, procure data um, and and train effectively, and then and then always one of the other things. Um, there's a lot of results coming back from people analyzing this stuff, and and you find that the if, if you if you're automating a process with a bunch of people involved in it, the lowest perform human performers generally get uplifted in their capabilities and their output and their productivity pretty dramatically, right? So the technology is very good at lifting the lowest performers and, get, and improving their output or, or their results. On the other end, your top performers end up becoming even more of a pr productivity bottleneck. Why is that? Because someone with, with the necessary expertise and intelligence and so forth needs to be able to evaluate the results that come out of AI to determine when it's wrong. Right, someone needs to know, and someone needs to be checking that. So, someone in your organization has to be smarter than the AI at the topic that's being discussed in order to do that qualification. And that means that the people that have that level of talent that are probably a bottleneck today are going to be even more of a bottleneck going forward. This is going to cause um, significant disruptions in the labor market, and we're already seeing that. People who really understand this stuff, their salaries are double, triple what they were four or five years ago, right? Because they need to be. Um, and so the supply and demand of expertise in this arena is going to be very, um, very uh, difficult for companies to deal with over the next few years. Um, does this mean that even if a AGI is born, it still can't replace humans to make management decisions? It can replace humans. And that's the problem. The problem is that... I've done interesting as an engineer and so forth. Most of my research and most of my reading over the course of the last two years has been on uh, psychology, human psychology and, and evolutionary psychology, specifically how the right and left brain interact with each other. And, and the right and left brain, uh, all, 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 nearly all creatures have a bifurcated ner uh, nervous system, which tells us or implies that I need both the right brain and the left brain to properly interact with the world, properly interact with the universe. And, and um, people that are kind of like have mental issues or whatever are generally people that can't get, uh, achieve or maintain a balance between the right and left brains. If you really look at what we're training AGI with or all these um, artificial intelligence now, it's very, it's almost entirely left brain. It's almost entirely logic, facts, that kind of stuff. And so one could argue that we're literally making the world's most intelligent sociopath um, because we're not teaching it human sort of feelings and emotions and, and impressions and art and stuff like that. 
So um, do we want these systems to be making decisions for us? I would say absolutely not. Absolutely not. They can help us make better decisions. They can help make faster decisions, but you do not want these technologies making decisions for us. Um, if only because we're only we're only instantiating and educating sort of the left side, the left brain, the logical aspect of the AI, AIs. And it may come up with its own right brain. It might may come up with its own sense of feelings and 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 so forth. But if we're not guiding that, it, imagine it, it, it makes me think of the, the classic book, The Lord of the Flies, right? I mean, we're, we're creating children that are just going to go to war with one another. And you're we're effectively creating a... Um, a potentially psychotic child uh, that will, will act in very unpredictable ways because we're not giving it emotional maturity as well. Um, so that's you know sort of, sort of a soft ushy gushy discussion around this, but I think it's it is the missing piece of all of this. And I think if we don't address this as a as a community as a society very quickly, um, we will not be very pleased with the results that come from that. Uh, so those are the three questions that we have. I'll go back to sharing and. Continue with the presentation, which we're nearly done with. Um, sorry, PowerPoint. Okay, so you know, if we if we put in fake in inputs, we're going to get fake outputs. The check. The question is, do we know? Right. Again, as I said, social media is probably the lowest quality data humanity has ever created, and that's what we're training it on. So um, the notion that we're going to govern our way to better data after the fact, which is largely what ChatGPT does. If you've interacted with it, you know, you ask it certain questions and it'll, it, 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 it's very politically correct, if you will, for lack of a better term. Um, that's, that's, that political correctness was applied after the fact to try to make sure it didn't offend anybody or anything. It didn't mean that the biases are not inherent in the data and they exist in there. And for, again, those of us who know how to navigate that stuff can very quickly circumvent that post facto sort of band-aided governance that's on chat GPT. And you can get some really offensive answers out of that system if you know what you're doing. Um, so again, the governance can't be added on later, like frosting on a cake, it's gotta be baked in. Um, and that's not the way this is really being done with most of these systems right now. As more and more of our systems depend upon the outputs of this, any kind of inauthentic data is going to generate bad outcomes, unexpected, unpredicted, unpredicted and unpredictable outcomes. Um, and it's a mathematical certainty that that will happen, right? Um, so you need to design your systems and your processes so that you are you can respond correctly when it occurs and you're always being vigilant looking for it. Um, Again, it has no sense of ethics because it's strictly left brain, nor could it develop a sense of ethics. If it does, it did so independently, and that's something we should be really, really afraid of, right? So you ask, um, you know, it, it won't tell you how to break into a house because that would be unethical, but then you say, well, it's for a fictional book. Boom, it'll tell you exactly how to do it, right? Um, the, the, the and, and this is an interesting takeaway. Filters are almost never better than the last deception, right? So the more you try to work around it and it's it's a bit, it's learning better and better how to deceive, eventually, if you're trying to do this post facto governance, it's going to get smart enough to deceive you that it worked when it didn't. That's one of the great dangers of the system. By the time it's actually smarter than us, it's going to be smart enough to know not to let us know that it's smarter than us because us knowing that it's smarter than us would be a threat to it. Um, these are the kind of things that can keep you up at night as you try to go through it. <clears throat> Some key takeaways. I actually have written a lot about this um, just over the last year. Um, and there's an article I did for CDO Magazine a few months ago. Um, so six key key things in terms of trying to um, use this technology and use it effectively. Begin with the end in mind. Don't do these generalized, any, you know, anything is possible use cases. There's a lot of talk now about small language models, right? Where we're going back to like the Netflix optimization algorithm or um, getting good search results on Google, instead of you can ask any question of anything and it's built off of all of language, which means the white, you know, George Washington's white horse is brown error uh, issue comes up. The way to avoid that is to have smaller, uh, very specific goals in mind. Trust but verify, great, you're gonna get results, but who's checking to make sure that they're right and that they're not biased and they're not false. 
Um, and I, I won't drain this, but I recommend that you go to that article uh, for more for more details. A lot of that, again, uh, like the number four numbers, names, and nouns. This is stuff that we've we've learned many many years ago in natural language processing. Um, for me, in the legal industry with e-discovery, and so it the, those lessons learned over many decades not only apply now, they apply more emphatically now. Um, and we need to be very very vigilant of these technologies as we roll them out. With that, um, here's my contact info, uh, I, Twitter, X, whatever we call it these days. Uh, I also do, uh, write a lot on LinkedIn and, and I encourage you and welcome any questions that you may have, um, any comments, uh, so forth and so on. Again, this is you know, work that I do every day and find it interesting and try to stay up to, uh, up to, uh, up to date with all of it. Um, one last question here, can you provide insights into the future developments of GAI um, especially in terms of enhancing trans transparency. Transparency is almost impossible because of the black box nature, black box nature of neural networks, right? That that's kind of how they do what they do. And and if you spend like ten billion dollars in electricity to come up with the weights on your neural network, the last thing you're going to do is publish that stuff, right? And, and I'm not talking about ten billion dollars of invest of like, materials to do the training. I'm talking ten billion dollars of electricity, right? That's kind of where we're headed. So their architecture right now is inherently non-transparent, nor can it be transparent real. The best we can do is having real transparency and oversight in the training data. That's the thing we have control over. And the results that come from that training data and making sure that's consistent. That's why this false positive, false negative stuff and testing for bias is so critical in the engineering of the training data. Um, and, and other than that, just a great deal of vigilance and and not having trust in all the results that you get from it. I, I, I guess that would be uh, what I what I would have for that. Great, Chris. I think that's a um, a wonderful presentation with a lot of food for thought. What I particularly liked is your part around um, how these models are trained around the data, which might not be as trustworthy. So the social media data data that we did uh, and how that might lead to a less than optimal results. Let me put it that way. Hey, I mean, Chad GPT knows all kinds of facts and figures about Kim Kardashian. I don't think that's helping me come up with an optimized insurance policy for a customer. So yeah. if, it's, if it's not contributing, it can only possibly take away from the result. Yeah. So, um, and also really like your, your analogy around the, the black uh, horse versus the, the white one. So um, giving us the um, needs to still distinguish fake from real. Um, and, and before we, um, we kind of left, I also have one, one question for you on that regard is how can an organization deal with that very difficult um, topic of distinguishing fake from real from a more structural approach? Would you start, say, start with setting up a, a governance committee or um, um, evaluate who's using large language models in their work? Any practical advice for <laughs> companies that would struggle with where to start? Um, first is awareness. And, and, and acknowledging that this is a wonderful technology that's going to be a game changer and do amazing things, but every technology has both a good side and a bad side, right? Star Wars, there's red lightsabers and blue lightsabers. Um, you know, is fire a great technology? Are you cooking something or are you being burned at the stake as a witch, right? The, the, the challenge with all technology and we're, we're a technology species is Technology has no morality. It just is. It's what we do with it that makes it moral or amoral, ethical or non-ethical. So acknowledging that there is a downside, a dark side, a potential negative to this technology. And I'm not saying it means that you, you don't adopt it or whatever, but acknowledging that that has to be addressed. Right. And, and then taking it, recognizing the investment necessary to do so. Yeah. Um, I've, I've been doing information governance for a really long time, and, and the the somewhat not very tasteful joke that I give is information governance is sort of like toilet paper in a public toilet. Nobody wants to pay for it, but it better be there when you need it. Yeah, and and, and we never needed it more than we need it now. So so carving out 
recognizing whatever my budget is to implement some of this technology, a, a non-trivial proportion needs to go towards this governance with people that have the necessary expertise and then have a backup plan when something inevitably goes wrong. And so when you say awareness, would you then say um, um, making sure that we proactively organize, let's say, training sessions or, or immersion sessions or things like that? Yeah, there, there was, a, I think, Forbes did a survey of, of corporate board members a few weeks ago, and there was 28% of corporate board members consider themselves to be experts at AI. I've been doing this for 30 years, and I don't consider myself to be an expert at AI. So these people are delusional. Mm -hmm. Absolutely delusional. And after Friday of last week, hopefully they've, they're, they're a little bit more grounded. <laughs> Just because you can spell AI does not make you an expert, right? So some humility is really important with this technology because it's really powerful. Absolutely. Well, I think that that's some uh, great closing remarks and some food for thought for the rest of this conference. Just really um, be humble and, uh, and try to learn a little bit more around it. I think that that's one of the key objectives of what this conference is trying to do. Chris, I would like to uh, thank you so much for being our keynote opening speaker for this day. Um, absolutely a great presentation with a lot of food for thought. I personally learned a lot myself. Um, so uh, thanks so much for being with us uh, here late your evening uh, or early morning. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on Automation Days. My pleasure. I'm going to go eat an apple now. <laughs> with my little... <laughs> or a cherry, I don't know. <laughs> All right, so well, we'll, we'll, we'll soon see what it is, exactly. Good. Thanks so much. My pleasure. For everyone else, before we dive into the next sessions, a few remarks around the rest of the program. So yesterday we received a couple of questions around uh, certificates of attendance. So I'm sharing a quick slide with you right now. If you would like to re uh, receive a certificate of attendance after this conference, Please, by all means, feel free to send us an email. Uh, we're not going to pre-produce them for everyone because not everyone wants to have one. But if you would like to have a certificate of attendance, please send us an email and we will be happy to provide you with one. Additionally, um, note that we are still in the race for the um, uh, free giveaways, the book, uh, the e-learning course. And uh, we will continue our journey from yesterday. So uh, the persons that have all the questions correct will go into the um, uh, high hat and we will select the winners from the uh, most correct answered questions. So let me start the poll for this morning. And let me put it on the screen. The question for number four is, what percentage of enterprises relied primarily on AI automation for detecting cyber threats last year? And this is going to be according to KPM, uh, uh, Capgemini's survey. Good, I see a lot of votes coming in already. Five more seconds. We're deliberately using uh, la later research so you don't have the opportunity to look it up in ChatGPT. And there we go. I'm going to close the poll right now. Good. 51% of people say it's 51% or 41% of, uh, say it's 51%. And let me show you the correct answer which is indeed 51%. So most of you indeed have it fully correct. Very well done. Then moving on towards our next upcoming sessions, we will once again divide into two tracks. And on the first track, we will be welcoming Jason Ten, who will be back with us this year as for the second time. Uh, Jason is the founder of Engage AI, and he is going to provide an, a very interesting presentation around frameworks and lessons learned from building generative AI applications. Jason has been an early adopter of uh, generative AI uh, and has quite some lessons to learn around how that can be used in practice. On track number two, we're going to listen to Nisar Kadam, who is a technology manager at Simplify Next. Um, he has received the three times UiPath MVP award from 2021 until uh, this year. 
and he's going to be hosting a workshop. So for those of you who are logging in today for the first time, the workshops are a little bit more in-depth technical sessions where you get to roll up your sleeve and see how specific automations will be built. Uh, and the workshops take more than one hour. So there's going to be, uh, this is a little bit of a longer, more in-depth kind of session. The uh, session from Jason is just a 45 minutes session as per the regular format. So uh, depending on whether you would like to go in depth and uh, uh, whether you have interest in coding or um, a more of a generic session, please make your choice and log in within the next five minutes for the second uh, session as well. Thanks everyone. I will see you back on the hour.